Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, today, uh, I want to thank uh, Ms. Brinkley for sending us uh, this uh, background. And while I'm placing this here, uh, reminding you that I have sent already on last week on Thursday, I sent you the um, the link for your third uh, task, the third survey task you uh, need to uh, submit this by Thursday night. So at midnight at Thursday, make sure that you submit uh, uh, the uh, third survey task. If you have any questions about it, of course, you're welcome to come and talk to me or send me an email. Uh, today, we'll talk about a, a new topic called democratic peace. But before we get into that, as usual, we'll talk about uh, the last meeting, which was on Thursday. And that was the end of the discussion about international treaties, focusing mostly on alliances, military alliances. Uh, in that context, uh, I've talked a lot about the uh, Ashley Leeds paper, emphasizing the importance of the content of the alliance in order to differentiate between different types of alliances and how that information represents actually a signal regarding the intentions of the, uh, of the countries that signed those kinds of agreements. What does that mean for the members of the alliance? What does that mean for the adversaries outside of the alliance? How that may shape behavior? And then we also saw that different types of alliances represent different risks or different probabilities of, uh, of conflict or war for those countries. Uh, then I talked about other elements related to uh, uh, military alliances of other types of international treaties. So I talked about the types of concessions that weaker countries are more likely to uh, to offer in order to secure a strong ally facing uh, facing uh, conflicts. And then we talked about the Furman and Lupo paper uh, that uh, discussed the arms control treaties led by the NPT, the Non Proliferation Treaty, and how that affects uh, the probabilities of conflict for those countries. And we ended the discussion by talking about uh, different uh, international treaties in the context of the economic uh, area, uh, the different incentives for uh, especially leaders of autocracies, how are they able to attract or ensure secure a foreign direct investment, especially their perception of their uh, expected survival in office, and then the WTO, an international institution, and how that accession process into the WTO represent or increases the likelihood of having actual trade liberalization based on all those provisions in those treaties and provide actually trade benefits. So that was a discussion on Thursday, finished the discussion about uh, international institution and treaties. If you have any question in that context, you are more than welcome to email me. Uh, this week, the topic is the democratic peace theory. It's a theoretical framework that relies on a liberal, structural, institutional, uh, approaches to explain the type of relationship that are more prevalent among democratic states and especially trying to come up with explanations why those relationships are evident. So let's start. The Democratic peace uh, research has made this proclamation calling this uh, area or this topic an empirical regularity in search of theoretical foundations. Why is that? Because from an empirical standpoint, the evidence suggests that democratic countries are not likely to engage in war. But there's still much debate, even today, until today, about the theoretical logic of that evidence, of that finding. So let's try and break it down a little bit more. Research on regimes show from pretty consistently democracies are just as war prone or conflict prone as non-democracies. So overall democracies and non-democracies are just the same, has the same uh, degree of likelihood of being in conflict. At the same time, democratic or liberal states tend to refrain from violent clashes among themselves. And this is an empirical finding which is very interesting because it motivates us to think whether there's something in the foundations of those regimes that affects their behavior in the international context. In essence, we wonder, do democracies have inherent aspects that make them less willing to fight other democracies? 
because we know the democracies are just as prone to go into conflict with non-democracies, but they're less prone to go into conflict with other democracies. So what is it? Uh, it means that we have to focus on identifying, and that's what those different researchers and uh, research studies of uh, democratic peace are doing, those different causal mechanisms within democratic countries that drive those outcomes, mostly answering the question, what are the causes of the democratic peace and why are those causes not affecting the same way when democratic countries are facing non-democracies? So we start with the liberal view of democratic peace. And according to the liberal view, there's two main characteristics for uh, liberal countries. First, they tend to display a peaceful foreign policy towards other liberal countries, for example, the United States and the British. Since the Reform Act in the earlier uh, decades of the uh, 19th century, in 1832, faced a lot of tensions and a lot of grievances, both from the British and from the Americans. But all those uh, grievances and tensions were always resolved by negotiations. So liberal countries will be a lot more peaceful to each other. Uh, at the same time, liberal states will display an international imprudence in their relations with non-liberal states. They will fight wars as a defensive wars because the liberal states are attacked by autocrats. And the causes for those wars may be different, and not just based on the regime of the attacker, but it is part of the, of the system. Uh, this is an approach which relies heavily on the work of political philosopher Immanuel Kant, who wrote The Perpetual Peace in the late 18th century. It's a theory of IR which describes the ethical and neural foundations of this peace between democratic countries. And it also provides an explanation of reasoning for why liberal states tend to be non-pacifistic, non-pacific, when they deal with non-liberals, liberal states. Uh, so according to Kant, there are three general aspects of this uh, perpetual peace. First of all, he describes how society was able to engage with some of the problems that it faced early on. Some of the problems that society faced when it comes to human behavior is the issues of moral autonomy, the emphasis on individualism, if I just care about myself and behave in a way that emphasizes my own benefit, how that impacts the social order. So one of the things that society did in order to solve those problems in the establishment of liberal states is to preserve judici judicial freedom on the basis of a representative government, which includes the separation of power. So that's one point. Now, those governments are based on the individuals and those governments also set the laws and the rules within those societies. So because the individuals must comply with the laws that are set, those laws will not be immoral. So there's less likelihood of a tyranny emerging. That's one idea behind that liberal approach. In addition, liberal states will uh, create some, kind, some form of a union between themselves. It will accept all those peaceful interactions between them, preserve the rights of the members of those countries. And that's gonna try to expand those peaceful relations across the globe to other states. And finally, in conjunction with this union of liberal states, they will also establish a cosmopolitan law intended to promote conditions of universal hospitality when it comes to how to treat foreigners, establish exchange of ideas, and, exchange, and establish trade relations with those. So those are some of the foundations of the liberal view. How does war come into play here? Peace by this view is the fulfillment of an ethical duty by all men. This is the way Kant described that. Uh, he views the French Revolution as a very important for the argument because it represented the spread of a cosm cosmopolitan view and how that's intended to uh, change society. Despite the fact that the, off the uh, focus of this view is on uh, peaceful behavior, it still allows room for conflict and wars because this is part of the process of spreading those kinds of views. 
wars represent learning opportunities for the values of peace. Now, peace is uh, driven by ethical and moral foundations, but mostly the factors that drive that are the negative outcomes of aspects such as fear, the use of force, and those are supposed to lead individuals to understand that wars are not the optimal solution. That's why we should engage in peace. That makes individual rights the more important, the focus of those kinds of states, and makes the conduct of war less likely. Um, now, in terms of how that, uh, that approach applies to dealing with other liberal countries, so because those focus on civil rights and the less focus on conflict behavior means that when liberal countries face other liberal states, they will be more hesitant. And wars are possible with non-liberal states in the quest of promoting freedom of protection of those different rights. And that's an obligation for those liberal countries intended to convince the non-liberal countries that they should enter their union of liberal states. That's the idea behind it, really. Now, there's also a material aspect to that view. It complements those more ethical or uh, uh, more ethical and uh, conditions. In order to promote commerce, which is a very central aspect of liberalism, we've talked about that, it can only happen uh, when there's no conflict. As I said, I talked a lot about liberal economic theory when I talked about liberalism and when I talked about a political economy, it emphasizes comparative advantage as the main driver of international cooperation in the context of uh, economic uh, relations and promotion of free trade to maximize the interest and the welfare of all the relevant actors. So all that is only possible when there's no conflict. Uh, overall, this uh, liberal approach as I said, emphasizes that unlike dictators that are, tend to be more aggressive in their nature, liberal states are founded on individual rights, equality before the law, free speech, and elected representatives that are fundamentally against war. So that's the idea behind it. But there's also a much more direct explanations to why citizens in liberal countries are against wars. They are the ones who pay the most or the highest price when wars erupt, both from a financial standpoint as well as from a human standpoint, because those citizens, those individuals, are the ones who participate and die in the war. So therefore, they will refuse to support or elect politicians that uh, promote these kinds of behaviors. And the leaders themselves will be aware of those incentives for the public, and they will have their own incentives in order to ensure their political survival to refrain from engaging in conflict. So that's the idea behind that. The public does not want to pay the cost of war so the leaders who want to ensure the public support will uh, follow through and behave in the same way. So that's the idea behind the liberal approach to democratic peace. The problem that this approach faces, first of all, the empirical evidence for the main, um, for the time that is most relevant to these discussions is weak. It's the main, most of the 19th century and the first half, a little bit more of the 20th century. So the empirical evidence in this case is not that supportive for those liberal arguments. In addition, this approach does not include uh, non-economic objectives. It ignores some of the more intangible aspects of relations between countries. So the way that countries behave, including reputation, status, credibility, as well as the domestic uh, motivations that affects behavior in the international context. For example, going into war in order to preserve social conditions. It does not approach, it is not addressed in this view. So that's some of the problems. Uh, there are other variants of this liberal view and I wanna talk about one of them, which is the normative angle. It is closely related to the liberal one. The idea behind the normative view of democratic peace is that democratic norms are essential to uh, any state and it shapes the institution and of course affects the behavior in the international context. In those countries, political competition is usually resolved by promoting norms of compromise 
and establishing stability and very specific, very uh, clear standards of life. Uh, in contrast, in non-democratic countries, the conflicts are usually seen as zero-sum games. And whenever conflicts emerge, even internal conflict in this case, because this is the idea of how do, how do norms emerge, internal conflicts are addressed by coercion and violence, and that sets standards, that sets norms in non-democratic countries of fear and mistrust. So that's the opposite kind of norms for what we have in democratic countries. Now, the international system, we already know, is described as an anarchy. Survival is key, right? So when countries interact one with each other, the idea is that, that they will behave in a way which fits with the norms that their rivals or the adversaries display. So they engage in clear reciprocate, reciprocate to the norms of their adversary or rival. Now, when two democracies have a dispute, are likely to engage, uh, and they may face conflict, then they operate based on the norms of their adversaries. And in this case, a democracy will operate based or reciprocate to the norms of the other democracy, which means that their interaction is likely to be peaceful and the likelihood of confrontation is very low. That explains why democracies will not fight. When they face non-democracies, democratic countries will have to adopt the norms of their rival, which are opposing in this case, and that increases the odds of violence. That is the normative explanation based on domestic norms, how that shapes international behavior and the idea of an international system, reciprocation, and why do democratic countries will fight each other, will not, I'm sorry, will not fight each other in uh, contrast to fighting non-democracies. A different explanation for uh, democratic peace is a structural one. I wanna talk about this one now. Uh, according to the structural view, international disputes require the leaders of those countries to mobilize public support and overall the support of members of those domestic institutions, whether it is the government, whether it is different interest groups, and that creates uh, or reduces the justification for violent clashes for all those actors. And mostly it means that it's harder for, uh, it's harder to mobilize for war, and it's much slower. In democratic countries, the process of going into war and preparation for war is a lot slower, mostly because there's a multitude of different constitutional and legal constraints on uh, confirming the decision to actually go to war and then actually engage in the actions that lead to war. And in this period of time between deciding to go to war and actually going to war, diplomacy takes place and it actually may mitigate the problem and resolve the dispute without going into war. And this is more likely when two democracies are facing a dispute. So this slow process of mobilizing support, which is also a very complex one, means that leaders of democratic countries are reluctant to go to wars, except in a very uh, emergency conditions. And all of that, of course, is based on a large number of constitutional and legal constraints on the actions of uh, the leaders. So that's the idea behind the structural view. Now, in reality, it's hard to uh, distinguish between those two models, the normative versus the structural explanations, because they share many common predictions about participation, about low support for the conflict. However, there are a couple of differences. For example, norms tend to develop slowly, slowly which suggests that older democracies are more likely to not fight one another compared to new democracies. Because in older democracies, those norms have already taken place and are very strong and prominent. In new democracies, norms are still in the process of taking hold, which makes it harder for them to be that dominant when it affects international behavior. From a structural standpoint, there are variations in the uh, structures of democratic countries. So for example, a presidential system is not as constrained in its ability to uh, go into war than 
a parliamentary one, especially parliamentary one based on a coalition government. So the American system based on the president, it's relatively, again, from a process standpoint, it's much easier to, to, to reach a decision to go to war, confirm that decision, authorize that decision, and actually take all the steps leading to war compared to uh, a parliamentary government. Where there's coalition partners, you have to ensure the support of all coalition members. If there's no support along the coalition, you cannot actually authorize going to war, which is in its simplest forms easier in, in a presidential regime. So that's a uh, part of the uh, differences here. Now, those two uh, views, the normative view and the structural view, are the two theories presented by uh, Maoz and Rasset in their paper, one of the first uh, empirical studies of the democratic peace. They test those two theories using uh, data on dyads and they, uh, their likelihood of engaging in a military dispute between 1946 and 1986. And this is one of the first studies that addressed a uh, democratic peace using quantitative uh, analysis. And one of the challenges they face, and we face, in, and that's, I want to expand that beyond that specific research, one of the challenges we face when, when we want to engage in a rigorous analysis using quantitative measures is how do we find those indicators that measure our theoretical concepts? So here there's, a, I, on, the, on the slides here, you can see the list of many of the factors that they account for. It's not all of them. I want to focus on some of them, and I want to focus first and foremost with democracy or the type of the regime. So I've already mentioned the, the, this concept of polity. If you remember, I've talked about that. The polity is a, a, a measure for the level of, uh, of uh, it, it's an indicator for the type of the regime, democracy uh, or non-democracy, which fits the autocracies or uh, dictatorship types of uh, states. Uh, there's different types of scales for democracies. The most accepted one rates countries on a minus 10 to a 10 scale, where 10 represents democracy and minus 10 represents or indicates an autocracy. And the, 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 these measures are mostly based on studying different countries, providing that scores based on a very clear set of, uh, set of standards, which includes the level of uh, uh, competition in the country, the competition for uh, political uh, positions, the, polit the level of political participation in the country, the openness of recruiting individuals into the political process, and the level of executive constraints. So the level of constraints that the country has on executive decisions. So for example, uh, the Congress, the American uh, Congress or the American Senate or the American House represents a constraint on the behavior of the executive, the behavior of the president, because it can limit him on some aspects. So those are an example for executive constraints. And all those kinds of aspects are being, uh, being calculated into that score. And that this is just an example for different scores for different countries over time. So for example, the United States, as you can see here, I'm not, I don't think you can see the date so far, but again, this is the 1946 to 2013, is rated as 10 as a democracy. We can see France during the same time frame. They had their drop in the level of democracy during the 19, uh, late 50s and early 60s. And we have here Iraq, which is much fitting to an autocracy. So the 10 is right up here, and this is the minus 10. So Iraq has been, uh, this is since the 1980s, I think, when the drop goes to minus 10, when uh, Saddam has taken a control of Iraq. And in here it's 2003 when the United States have occupied Iraq and that led to change in a lot of those domestic uh, institutions and norms and that improved how Iraq was viewed during that time. And we also have Nigeria as an example. I just gave you some examples for different countries around the world and their quality score and how that changed over time. So this is just one measure. Uh, for this specific study, the Mao's and Russet paper, they also account, for example, with domestic violence. How do we measure domestic level of domestic violence by counting using data about political death or number of political executions. Economy is a very, very common factor in those kinds of models. And there's a lot of different measures, but most of them revolve around uh, trade or uh, different measures of the GDP. So in this case, they use the change in the gross GDP per year. That Changes in those kinds of numbers represent whether there's an economic expansion or economic recession. And they also account for norms. Now, overall, in terms of their findings, 
They found that democracies indeed are less likely to participate in militarized disputes. So they find support for the general idea of the democratic peace. They find support overall for both of the models, both the normative and the institutional or the structural one. But the stronger evidence in their data and their study is for the normative models. So norms of countries are what drives two democracies to not going into war with each other. So that's uh, their main findings. So this study by uh, Maus and Russet was one of the first that used a quantitative analysis to assess uh, the democratic peace. I want to talk about uh, others. So we talked about different approaches to explain uh, the democratic peace. I talked about the liberal and the normative explanations, which share a lot of similarities. And now I want to talk about the institutional explanation for democracy, which is a lot closer to the structural view that Mahomes and Russet has uh, presented. And this is uh, based on the uh, Bueno uh, de Mosquita uh, paper that you had for today. Uh, the study expands on the institutional foundations of the democratic peace theory. It uh, heavily relies or based on the assumptions that political leaders are mostly motivated by their own ensuring their own survival. And we'll get to that in a second. And one of the main benefits of that specific approach is that it allows us to explain the behavior of leaders or their decisions, not just for democratic leaders. So it's any type of leader, democratic leader, non-democratic leader, we can use that approach, that theory we're going to talk about now to explain their behavior, again, mostly motivated by ensuring their political survival. Uh, so uh, as I said already numerous times over the last 25 minutes, central argument of democratic peace theory is the lack or the relatively low probability of violent conflict between two democratic states. And the democratic peace theory also talk about how democracies fight wars, but this is an aspect of this theory which we're going to talk about on Thursday. So I'm going to talk about it now. Now for the uh, Bueno uh, de Mosquita et al, their motivation for this approach was the problems that the existing explanations proposed, mostly their inability to explain all the, irregular, the irregularities of those different, of those of the theory. So most specifically, when we talk about normative explanations, their view is mostly ad hoc in the sense that we observe that there's no wars between democratic countries. So we assume that the reason for that is the norms which are present in those countries. So two democratic countries have shared norms. We see that they do not go into conflict. So we just assume that this is the reason why not. If we want to present a much more stronger and valid explanation for why two democratic countries do not engage in wars, we need to ensure there's a clear causal direction between norms, if that's our explanation, and the outcome, lack of war. If you remember, I talked about that specific aspect exactly of causal direction and the difficulties when it comes to norms, when we talked about liberalism and we talked about constructivism. How can we be sure, how can we show that the norms were the explanations that leading to the outcome that we talk about. So that's one problem. Uh, another problem related to the normative explanation is that question that they raise is, if norms are that prevalent in shaping the behavior of those countries, where are these norms when democratic countries are attacking or fighting against weaker countries? That's another uh, point of, uh, of a problem that they raise. When they talk about the structural explanation, it's a lot more logical in their sense, but the problem that they raise is that this kind of explanation should be valid for all types of interactions, not just the interactions between democratic countries and using the structural explanation to, uh, to offer a reason for why they, don't, not, they do not go into war. This kind of explanation should be valid for all types of wars that democratic countries are fighting. So if those are the problems of the theories, how can we explain or how can we improve those explanations and explain the democratic peace? They offer selectorate theory. Reminding you again that you've already heard that a specific framework. I talked about it and I presented it for the first time when I talked about uh, political economy, when we talked about sanctions, and when we talked about foreign aid a couple of weeks ago. And uh, also last week when I talked a little bit about uh, some of the international treaties, 
Selector theory is a framework that offers a formal representation of the political institutions in any type of state, doesn't matter what its regime, what its regime is, and it can be used to derive hypotheses uh, on the behavior of the countries in multiple contexts. So the original formulation of selector theory was related to foreign policy and to, engage, to behavior in the context of war, but as I said, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the implications or the application of selector theory in the context of uh, sanctions, foreign aid, and other areas. So I'll just do a quick uh, running, uh, run again on the main basics of the theory, just to make sure that we remember that. There's the selectorate, which is one important concept in that theory. This is the members of society which choose the political leadership. So that's most of members of citizens of the public. Uh, again, that can change between uh, types of regimes. We'll get to that, but that's the selectorate. And then we have the concept of the winning coalition, which is a subset of the selectorate. And that's the majority of individuals that the, that the politicians has to secure in order to ensure that they can uh, survive in power or secure their incumbency. If a, pol if a politician is able to ensure that he has the winning coalition, she or he has the winning coalition, they will keep their job, essentially. Um, now we have to think about the size of the winning coalition on uh, different regimes. So democracies, the winning coalition is large because it includes essentially all voting citizens. In this case, the leader has to secure the majority of the popular support in order to ensure her position. In non-democracies, the winning coalition is a lot smaller. The leader in that case relies on a much smaller circle of supporters. Think about uh, military types of regimes, think about monarchies, or think about single party dictatorships. This is a much smaller number of people that you have to ensure their support in order to stay in your position. And the last point, really, in the basics uh, of the selector theory is how do leaders secure their desired winner coalition? They offer goods. Those goods can be public goods, can, can be private goods. Um, for democracies, usually leaders will engage or will provide public goods because their winning coalition is, a much, is much larger. So they cannot provide private goods, private benefits to all the citizens because resources are limited. They can't offer everything to everyone. So they will provide what's called private goods. So that's healthcare for everyone in the countries that have that, that's national security for everyone, that's public goods. Private benefits are more likely non-democracies, which is specific benefits that the leader can provide to its winning coalition, to its supporters. And because in non-democracies, that winning coalition is a lot smaller, it makes sense to use those and to provide those private benefits. Now, this is, again, just a quick reminder about, uh, about uh, selector theory. And now let's go to the application of that idea in the context of uh, national security, international uh, security or war. So uh, in a word, the question that um, leaders are facing in this context is how do they distribute the resources to uh, when they uh, engage in conflict and how do they distribute those different resources to the conflict versus other purposes? The main question essentially is how much effort do leaders want to exert in order to try and win the conflict? Now, just a second, there it is. Uh, as I said, resources are limited, so you cannot invest everything in a war. You have to do a trade-off between how much you invest in the war and how much you invest in other places. But the outcomes of the conflict are very important for political leaders because they represent information for members of their winning coalition, for the public, and affects their decision whether they want to retain the leaders. So the outcomes of the conflict in that case represent the rewards in this specific context that leaders provide to their, uh, to their supporters. And this is where the type of political institutions in regimes matter. Now, as I said, uh, democratic uh, leaders tend to focus on public goods. And as a result, a failure in their enacted policy, so in this case, a failure in winning the war, uh, 
is problematic because they will have actually no rewards they can provide to their supporters. So that means the democratic leaders will exert a lot more effort, invest a lot more resources into winning a conflict because winning the conflict is the main route they can take to secure their political survival, right? That also means, and this is an aspect we're gonna talk about actually on Thursday, is that leaders of democratic countries are more likely to focus on going into wars that they think they can win. But that's a different point. Let's leave that to Thursday. As I said, the main point is because democratic leaders can only provide public goods to their supporters, losing a war is a lot more problematic to them. So they will uh, increase and they will invest a lot more in winning wars. And as you can see here, this is just an example. Those are the famous pictures of the uh, American factories manufacturing the different, uh, the different uh, uh, war fighting tools that the American military needed during the Second World War, whether it is tanks or airplanes in that case. So that's democracies and war effort. At the same time, let's talk about those gentlemen. For autocrats, and you have here some of the superstars with that list over the last uh, 100 years or so, autocrats, dictators rely on a much smaller winning coalition, right? So those who are relying on a small winning coalition tend to, to employ or to provide private goods to secure their support. The support of that winning coalition is based on providing private goods to those individuals. Now, as long as the dictators are able to provide those goods, which in most cases are financial or political benefits to members of the party, to members of the uh, elite military establishment or members of their own family, as long as they can provide those uh, private goods, the, the risk of losing office is very, very, very low to those leaders. And the result here are the implications of that dynamic for when it comes to international disputes. International conflicts are much less of what can be viewed as an inflection point for the survivals of dictators. Dictators can lose an international conflict and still survive politically, which also means that they will invest less resources, which means that by design, the likelihood of winning the conflict are a lot lower. So those are the differences in terms of how much effort different leaders will, uh, different types of leaders based on their regimes will invest in a conflict. Now let's link this whole dynamic back to the democratic peace. When we think about two democracies facing a dispute, the leaders in both countries face the same types of risks and are likely to exhibit the same type of effort. So if country A and country B both of them are democracies and they face a dispute, the leaders are likely to behave in the same way. Now, also, when we think about it from a strategic standpoint and thinking about rational choices, those two leaders should be able to understand that their, the leader of the rivals, so the leader of country A, a democracy, should realize and understand that the leader of country B will behave in exactly the same way that like, like she does. Invest a lot of effort and take the risks. So again, taking all that back into the rational decision process, reminding you again, or paging again, that research I talked about from Fearn, back when I talked about rational choice, they are more likely to favor a peaceful resolution of the disputes rather than investing a lot of resources, engaging in violence, when both know that their chances of winning the war are actually much lower, which increase the risk for their own political survival because they will present to their supporters a failure in the policy they engaged in. And that's the idea behind this institutional-based explanations for democratic peace. Because leaders can only provide that benefit in the sense of providing successful policy, and both of the leaders in both democracies understand that dynamic, it's a lot more rational for them to solve their dispute peacefully. Uh, okay, so that's democratic peace based on the uh, institutional uh, explanation. As you can see from the discussion that I, uh, that I made over the last uh, 10 minutes or so, this is a further development of the structural idea on some level and that the main benefits of this approach 
is that it provides an explanation for the behavior of all types of leaders. So it explains based on that logic why democracies are not likely to engage in conflict, but we can also ex use that to explain the behavior of non-democratic leaders. It helps us to understand why leaders of autocracies are not likely to invest the same amount of effort and resources in a conflict such as uh, democratic leaders. So there's a lot, as you saw so far in the discussion in the, in the lecture I had so far today, there is multiple types of uh, explanations to the democratic peace. Not always, there is, there's not always consistency among them. And that leads, of course, to a lot of criticism. And that's what I want to talk about now. First of all, why do we need to uh, assess the theory of democratic peace? First, as I said, so the first point is that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of research on that. Those theories were presented, most of them, in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Until today, there's still a lot of research on democratic peace. So it's important to assess the validity of that argument. In addition, there are practical aspects. Many policymakers use the insights from those uh, theoretical frameworks to drive their views and to promote the need to expand the number of democracies in the world to promote global peace or securing the United States if we're talking about the more specific context of the United States. Uh, some of the foundations for the policy that George W. Bush has engaged in when it comes to the uh, war in Iraq in 2003 was that if Iraq will be a democracy, it's less likely to be a threat to the United States. So you can see a lot of those democratic peace foundations in that logic. So uh, I will talk about research by uh, Christopher Lane, who was a professor actually in the Bush School here in Texas a and And he focuses on the problems, mostly with the causal logic of the theory. And he offers realism as a better predictor or better explanations for the interaction between democratic countries and why it's less likely to go into wars. Just as a quick reminder about the idea behind the realist explanation, even though so many of you have wrote your midterm papers on realism, there's no need for me to actually remind that to you. The focus is on the interest, on strategic concerns, facing a disputes when the issue at stake is critical, then actors are more likely to engage in using threats, ultimatums, and engage in costly actions, and military balance and military resources are another crucial factor. That's the idea behind a realist explanations to, uh, to conflict. Um, so uh, he, uh, in terms from an empirical standpoint, he uses four case studies to test those completing explanations. So he uses four historical cases when two democratic countries were on the verge of war and test whether the democratic peace logic makes sense to explain why they didn't go into war, or actually the realist explanation is better. Okay, so uh, before I go into uh, those two explanations, those two, a uh, couple of those examples, I'll stop for the attendance word for today. So the attendance word for today is fight. We talk about war, so it's fit. The word, uh, attendance word for today's lecture is fight. All right, so uh, Lane discusses several uh, aspects of criticism, but the main point that he offers, or the main challenge for the democratic peace is, if indeed democracies rely on public views as a driver of their behavior in conflict, especially in conflict versus other democracies, then overall, they should be less war prone against any type of regime, not just against other democracies. If the costs of war that drive public opinion related to the war and drives their support for leaders, if those costs, whether they are human costs or whether they are financial costs, if those costs are that much of a burden for democracies, why does it matter if they fight against another democracies or they fight against a non-democracy? That's the main point that he raises. And to show the problem of that argument, he engages in different, uh, as I said, historical case studies. I'm gonna talk about two of them now. And that's gonna be the focus for uh, this discussion about the criticism of the democratic peace. So the first case that I wanna talk about is the Trent Affair. It describes tensions between uh, the American, especially the Union government and the British uh, during the American Civil War. The crisis emerged in uh, late 1861, in November of 1861, when the uh, American ship, the USS uh, San Jacinto, intercepted the Trent, which was a neutral um, vessel, a mail ship, 
And as part of this, uh, of this incident, uh, the uh, American ship has uh, boarded the British uh, ship, the Trent. It uh, arrested two officials, two members of the uh, Confederate uh, government or Confederate army that were intended to go to be representative of the Confederate, uh, Confederate uh, army in uh, Europe. Those individuals were uh, James Mason and John Slidell. Uh, so that's the direct uh, incident that led to, the, to that specific crisis. Beyond that, there was a lot of concerns with the British regarding the uh, Civil War when it comes to the blockade that, the, uh, that many of the ports in the United States were facing, as well as the British limited access to the cotton industry in the South. So there was also economic uh, incentives to the British involvement in that case. Now, when the incident uh, emerged, as I said, in November of 1861, the British public responded uh, with great anger to the affair, mostly due to what they view as violation of international law, boarding a neutral ship and arresting two individuals, members of that ship. The public through the media, through the representative, placed a lot of pressure on the government and led the government on some level to accept a, a, an issue, a threat on the Americans of going into war and taking actual steps in preparation for war. So this is, for example, was the response from the British Prime Minister in one of the uh, main uh, uh, British uh, government meetings in late November 1861. Lord Palmerston have said those arguments, suggesting that the British were very serious and very, uh, it was very important for them to address that specific affair. The British were ready to go to war according to that. Uh, now talking about it from the American side of that, uh, of that incident, uh, the Union government faced uh, many challenges in the Civil War and during that time. Uh, nevertheless, the public, the American public, displayed clear anti-British sentiment at the time and a lot of pressure on the Union government to stand up against the threat from the British. And a lot of that motivation for the, uh, this anti-British sentiment of the public was that British declared neutrality in the Civil War, which members of the public viewed as a de facto recognition of the South. So that's part of the motivation. So that's the background and the beginning of the crisis. Now, uh, the British have uh, instituted their threat of going into war. And despite the pressure from the American pro uh, public on the Union government, the, by the end of 1861, which was about two months or so from the uh, Trent incident itself, the US conceded in the crisis and uh, accepted most of the British demand, which included the release of those two officers, and meaning that the ship, the San Jacinto, acted without official direction from uh, Washington. And the question in this case is why? So according to uh, what Lane presents, the historical evidence that Lane presents, one of the central concerns for President Lincoln was he, he pretty early realized that the Union cannot fight wars on two fronts. It cannot fight the Civil War, which was consuming the vast majority of the resources, as well as going now into war with the British. And what Lane argues here, and this is a classic realist view based on balance of power, the amount of military strength, as well as having the enough resources. And arguments based on, on uh, norms, which is one explanation of democratic peace, right? has nothing to do with that because the British public and the American public allegedly have the same types of norms. But in this case, those two publics, the American public and the British public, were much more likely to prefer a conflict over conciliation. So it's not possible to explain why those two democratic countries did not actually engage into war based on a public related explanation, public opinion related explanation. That's the point that he makes here. And that's why according to the argument that Lane presents, the realist interpretation of that incident is a lot more powerful and provides a more valid explanation for why two democracies did not go into war rather than looking on some of those foundations of a democratic peace based on a public opinion or shared norms. That's one example. Another example that he uh, uh, presents is the crisis in the Ruhr region in Europe. These are ten tensions between France and Germany. Uh, erupted in, in 1920, 1923 and it erupted into a very small scale violence in that region after France occupied 
that region in 1923. Now a little bit about the, uh, the background for the crisis. Since the end of the First World War, uh, Germany, which has, uh, uh, has been uh, introduced as the democratic country called the uh, Weimar Republic, was uh, pushing to decrease the pressure on its economy that was mostly based on the different uh, elements of the Versailles Treaty, that the, the treaty that ended the First World War, included a high number, a very high volume of war reparation tended to be paid for uh, members of the uh, participants of the war led by the French. And the Germans uh, tend to uh, put a lot of pressure in uh, revising the treaty in order to uh, re uh, release some of the pressure on the uh, German economy. The French at the same time, uh, even before the First World War, but mostly after the First World War, were very concerned about the possibility of the rise of Germany. It was described during that time as what was called, according to what uh, Lane presents, Germanophobia. It led to a very aggressive foreign and security policy when it comes to Germany, offering no concessions and placing persistent pressure that is intended to prevent Germany from increasing its power again in Europe. Now, this policy was uh, highly supported by the elites and the public in France. Uh, it, was, uh, it was so important for that members of society that in late 1922, the prime minister actually faced risks to, to his own uh, political survival if he did not uh, sustain that anti-German policy. Now, the occupation of the region, the Ruhr region, it took place in 1923. The annexation of the region took place in 1923. Uh, the French already had troops in that area as part of the post-World War I treaty. And it was also another action intended as part of that overall security policy that France was instituting at the time. And it was intended to increase the pressure on Germany and its own economy. So that's a little bit of the background of the event itself. Just to give you a context, so this is the French troops in the region. And this is actually a small scale a map of the area in Europe, Germany here, France here. And this is the entire Rhineland area, which was uh, demilitarized under the uh, Treaty of Versailles after the First World War. And when we talk about the specific rural region where this crisis began, this is this area here in the northern part of that area, uh, right uh, on the German border at the time. Uh, the German response to the uh, occupation of uh, the French occupation was a, a limited uh, type of violence. It focused on civil resistance, different types of actions uh, of civilians that were uh, living in those areas of the uh, rural region. And they called for non-cooperation by the workers in the region. There was a very limited coordinated uh, sabotage campaign against the occupying forces of France. But overall, there was no major violence between the two countries. And again, coming back to what Lane is trying to uh, accomplish here in this study, he's explaining why. He suggests that the main reason for the German response was the lack of military, economic, and financial capabilities to mount, to mount such a campaign. The German didn't have the resources to engage in extended military conflict with the French or in pushing the French troops out of the region. At the same time, he also argues that the French motivation for this entire uh, event was strategic power-based action in the pursuit of becoming a regional power in Europe and increasing its economic gains from uh, occupying the area. So again, this is a kind of a, a textbook in a way resource power-based explanation, which is a realist view to why France engaged in, the, in its own actions, and at the same time, why German, the German response was also based on realist uh, ideas. And those response was a very limited response to what the, the French were doing, and mostly not going into conflict. Again, why does it not fit, according to what Lane argues, with a democratic peace argument? mostly focusing on the public or the uh, overall, the, the, the views in France, both the public as well as the elites had big suspicions of Germany even before the First World War and mostly after when it came to this specific incident. Uh, 
And those suspicions on those opinions by the public and the elites in France were the main motivations for the more aggressive types of policies still that French uh, has implemented. And despite that, uh, those uh, public sentiment, it did not culminate in a major war due to mostly realist type factors, resources and military power. That's the main point that uh, Lane uh, offers here. So that's just two historical examples suggesting the, some of the problematic aspects of democratic peace, mostly relying on uh, public views of conflicts and the public support for, uh, for uh, governments and how that shapes the behavior of the governments when it comes to international context. And that's a good, um, it's a good starting point for the discussion that we're gonna have on Thursday when we're gonna focus a little bit on those specific victims or uh, those specific players in this democratic peace theory logic. The public itself, does the public behave in a way that fits with the way that the democratic peace theory suggests they should? And that's on Thursday. If you wanna read more about uh, the basics of democratic peace, this is some research from the last uh, decade or so, including a very recent paper actually. And as I said, overall, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of research on that. Topic. Um, with that, I will uh, sign off for today and I will see you on Thursday. Goodbye everyone.